Uh, greetings, everybody. Welcome back to Taking Care of Business. Last week, we had such a great show with uh, Jay Salpeter and Rick Frischman. Not Frischman. He's somebody else. <laughs> and not Rick Friedman either. <laughs> um, that we, we actually got them to schlep back to the station and do another show. So thank you guys for coming back. It's almost like we never left. It, it, you, know what, you know, it's like, it's like game shows. <laughs> when, you, when you record like, you know, uh, five hours in a row and you got yourself a week. Um, in case you guys don't know uh, who, who are out there listening, uh, these gentlemen are uh, the authors of a phenomenal book called A Criminal Injustice, published by Random House. It, it, it's not just a book about a wrongful conviction and the resurrection of a life and the trial system. It, it's about the human struggle. It's about persistence. It's about hope. It's about despair. It's about Digging and digging and digging. And, 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 you know, a lot of times people don't feel that it's not worth the effort. Well, these guys went through a heroic effort, a truly heroic effort, swimming against the tide, <laughs> carrying boulders uphill, walking on glass and fire to, to release a man who is in jail for over 6,000 days and, and give him something that, that we take for granted, our freedom and our liberty. So welcome to our show. And last week we talked about so many cool things that I felt that there was another, at least another hour out there to talk about. So again, Paul Solomon's our co-host. Uh, thanks, Paul, Jay, and Rich. Thanks. So I got to ask. We'll just pick up where we left off. And if you're listening on uh, tcbradio.com or tcbradio.mypodcast.com or at a criminal injustice.com on the website somewhere, uh, we love your feedback. We love your information. So Jay. You're hired to handle an investigation, and during the investigation, you have the miracle, and I guess that's the right word, the miracle of actually holding in your hands at the crime scene the murder weapon. What was that like? It was an amazing find, and, you know, to, to me, it was very emotional. The whole case, to me, has become emotional. Everything since finding the first witness, Glenn Harris, who led me to the pipe, uh, it's been emotional. So uh, to actually be told where a pipe was thrown possibly 17 years prior and to actually go out and find it was amazing. Now, when we found the pipe, it, it was in the property uh, of a family that has a lot of land and they never had this area cleaned. So they gave us permission. I hired a uh, crime scene fellow from the New York Police Department that retired and we, you know, we got a metal detector, and uh, the the finding of the pipe was the most amazing thing too. While Charlie Hotz was out there looking with the metal detector, you know, it was a morning, had a couple of cups of coffee. I took a little walk on the property, and uh, while relieving myself, I I looked down and uh, I found a pipe, and this was the pipe. Did did it hit you right away? That this was the, the the pipe, or did it? I mean, what was it, like, you were looking at it, 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 did it dawn on you, was, or is it like a, a wow kind of moment, or it was like well, a deductive uh, thing? No, I, I, you know, I felt this was the pipe, because we were all over the property, and so far there were no other pipes uh, until I walked, and it's what the pipe looked like. Now, when the pipe was recovered, we sent it out to Barry Sheck's lab out in, uh, you know, California, and... Basically, it, it, you know, unfortunately, there was no DNA on it because it's been weathered for so many years. But it was consistent to the fact that this pipe was out there 17 years. It was pitted, and the, the test that they did, we were on the money. Wow. That's yeah. got to be an amazing thing. Oh, it was, it, it, and that's when we started our hearing, the 440 hearing. That was a little, uh, you know, that started off the hearing. And it was a, like a bombshell announcement to, to the press and to the court that we recovered the weapon. Unfortunately, the district attorney's office, who we notified, and, you know, I was ordered by the attorneys not to move the pipe, to leave it there. And what we did, we secured it. They never came the day that I found it. They never came the next day, never responded. You know when they responded? About five months later. That's when they you must came. have been standing there a long time. <laughs> yes, uh, I love the spot, but uh, that's that's when they actually, uh, you know, came back to look at where we found the pipe, but not the actual pipe. For you, was that the most p 
pivotal moment for you as an investigator, or were there other moments where you got some testimony or something else that really jolted things? There was, well, a couple of moments. The main moment to me, I think, is what started this whole case that brought it back into court, you know, that I found Glenn Harris. I found Glenn Harris, who subsequently became, was the driver of the car. I did some history when I was, you know, looking at the case when Bob Godley, uh, who was Marty's first trial attorney, gave me the opportunity to come to his office and look at the case. And this was before I decided to take the case. When I went to his office and looked at the case and, and read what was in there, I said, you know what, this is missing something. You know what is missing? It was missing an investigation. This kid is sitting in jail, and, and if there was anything that I could do for him, I had to give him the opportunity to finally get the murder of his parents' case investigated. And, I, you know, looking through the papers, and I'm going to jump to it, I found a gentleman by the name of Glenn Harris, who is an associate of Joe Creighton. Now, Joe Creighton basically will become and is the murderer of Seymour, is one of the murderers of Seymour and Arlene Tankliff. I found Glenn Harris, and amazingly, he was in prison. And I started a pen pal relationship with this lunatic. You know, he was a really crazy guy, but he was unbelievable. I went to see him, and, you know, I said to him, Glenn, before I come up to visit you, if you don't have anything, please don't bring me all the way up there. He said, Jay, come on up. You might be right. So I went up there with the expectations of possibly just getting some information. Maybe Joe Creedon told him something. And it, it was quite a, a trip. I, I took Glenn's mother, who was a former IRS agent and who was very you know, cordial to me. Uh, we went up. We stopped to get our hair done in, in, a, in a barber shop in Bayside. And then we went up to the trip. To a, and it was quite a long trip. And when I got to meet Glenn, this is the moment that you asked. Glenn Harris, when I met him, told me that he was the driver of the car that brought Peter Kent and Joe Creighton the night of the, of the incident and the murderers of Seymour and Arlene Tankliff. But, I, you know, at, at that point, it was like mind-boggling. I'm expecting to hear, well, Joe Creighton told me he was there. This is the guy that drove the car. Nobody knew this. Nobody, you know, was Marty in jail. And here we have the first actual person that I interviewed, you know, that might have been associated or had some information, is the driver of the car. What what made people come forward? Was it was it their conscience? Was it the fact that an innocent man, man was in jail? Was it your persistence? Was it a domino effect where one guy kind of led the way so other people... I think it was an, a, an accumulation of many things, like Glenn Harris. When, when the murder happened, you know, he sat in the car. He never claimed to have gone in. He thought he was going there for burglary. And unfortunately, he knew when, when you know, the guys came out that something was wrong. They, they weren't coming out with items from a burglary. And he heard it the next morning. So he couldn't come forward at that time because he was on parole. And it's something that stayed with him until he had the opportunity. Now, Glenn Harris is an outright career criminal, drug addict, thief. In all his crimes, he's been in and out of jail, never once laid a hand on a person. But as for the other witnesses, many times people say, Jay, you did a great job. Wow, you know, and I'm going to say the attorneys too, but they say, Jay, what a job. You want investigator, you're like the hero. Not true. The people that came forward, the witnesses in this case, 20-plus witnesses who came forward on their own after, you know, I found them or they, they contacted us, they came and testified to help Marty become free. And we could not offer them immunity. We could not, you know, uh, protect them. There was nothing we could do. And all that happened to these people where they came in to an American courthouse in Suffolk County, a priest, a nun, Joe Creedon's actual son, Joe Jr., who Joe Creedon admitting to, to being a participant in the murder, uh, a fellow by the name of Joe Graydon. Joe Graydon was part of the first time that they attempted to kill Seymour Tankliff. Unfortunately, it was a miss hit, and then, you know, there was another try where they succeeded. But Joe Graydon came forward and to told us that, you know, it was supposed to be a robbery. Like I said in, in your past show, that that Tankliff was owed a lot of money by Jerry Stuman. He would pick up the money on a Sunday night. 
They were to be there waiting to make it look like a robbery. When he came out, they were going to kill him, take the money, which was going to be Graydon's pot and Creedence pot, and that's and Jerry Stone was behind that. We had, uh, you know, we had uh, Scott Glass. We had a multitude of witnesses that came forward. And all they did was became humiliated by the Suffolk County District Attorney, that they were nefarious scoundrels, misfits. By the, the judge would say this, and so would the District Attorney. And I think Rick could fill you in on some of that, too. Yeah, you know, you talk about, you know, Jay said that, that he couldn't, uh, the defense team couldn't offer people anything. They also couldn't intimidate people. And there was a guy, Jay just mentioned, uh, Brian Scott Glass, who... Uh, Jay went and found, because he'd, he'd heard his name come up as another of these uh, characters from that Selden crowd, you know, with Creedon and Kent. Um, and he, he tried to spend months trying to find him, uh, finally was able to connect with him. And Glass came in and, sp- and spoke to Jay and the attorneys and said that he had been offered this work. I'm putting my little fingers up in quote marks, uh, the work of, of killing the tank lifts. Um, and then he had uh, declined the work and passed it on to Joe Creedon. Uh, the, and outsourcing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. What we found out later was that, uh, that, that uh, Glass didn't have the stomach for something like that. Um, but uh, he was willing to come into court the next day, actually, and testify to that. The next day comes, and Glass is nowhere to be found. And which is what uh, Jay was 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 fearful of because he thought that Glass uh, was not going to come into court, and uh, unless he watched him overnight in a hotel room. What happened was that Glass disappears. He reappears several months later, and now is changed his story, and claims that he made it all up. He was just kidding around. What happened in between was that Glass had a pending uh, uh, armed robbery charge, and would have been a would have been a, a third felony, and would have sent him upstate for twenty could have been for twenty five years, and suddenly, Glass changes his mind, says that he was just kidding when he said that, and that charge disappears, and what so a that's lucky coincidence. <laughs> well, yeah, not only that, what was amazing, when he came to us, he also wanted an attorney. And as I said, we could offer our witnesses zero. He wanted an attorney because he knew that the police were looking for him. He had no money for an attorney. Who was his attorney, Rick? His attorney turned out to be uh, the son of a federal judge, Leonard Wexler. William Wexler is the son. Uh, Wexler, Jr. is a pretty major attorney in Suffolk County big cases, big fees. Scott Glass is a street street criminal with not a penny to his name, and he winds up with this big deal lawyer who's, by the way, uh, shares office space with the judge's father and the head of the Democratic Party. uh, Who can't make this stuff up. (laughs) So the connections continue across the week that we've been, uh, since we started talking about this. So I got to ask you some dynamics about the book. Oh, by the way, you're listening to Taking Care of Business, tcbradio.com, 89.7 FM, WCWP, broadcasting from the Abrams Communication on the campus of CW Post College. Thank you for listening. If you want to send us an email, tcbradio, WCWP, at yahoo.com. All right. So when you when you had a, you know, I, I, wrote, I was fortunate enough to write a book and get published and all this other stuff. And it took me three years to write my book. And my book is like a third of the size of your book. And your book has detail and nuance and fact and context and little stories. You talk about um, personal stories about things that you did in your career, Jay. And how did you, you know, just, you know, every book starts the same, either a blank computer screen or a blank pad. <laughs> how, how did you go from zero to a wealth of information? And yet I, I had the feeling after I read the book that you could have written more if you wanted to. Well, in fact, uh, there was more it's, uh, uh, that, that, that had to be cut because, you, you know, you really can't publish it. How eight, many pages were cut, Rick? Well, well uh, I, I cut, I don't want to, well, I'll say 60,000 words I cut to get wow. down to the this, book, which is still pretty big. So. This is the size of Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> By, uh, yours. 
But uh, I thought you you said uh, every book starts the same. I thought you were going to say you know it was a dark and stormy night, but. Um, no, I meant, I meant yeah, no. you know, you know, the the, the road of ten thousand yeah. steps starts with with w- yeah. one, and you know, how did you get from the the first step to the ten thousandth step? I mean, the, uh, you have pictures. I mean, you must have had to corroborate transcripts and notes, and it was just accumulating. I mean, there's sort of this two parts to the the material, and one is the the original case. So there were, you know, thousands of pages of transcript from the, the trial, the pretrial hearings, the appeals, um, all kinds of documents, police reports, um, and then there's then there's the the reinvestigation, which is Jay's part, which which um, you know came out of a combination of came out of Jay's head in terms of his memory of of relating things that uh, that happened before we got together. And then at that point, kind of just being with Jay alongside him really uh, for the next two, three years and talking and just, and I, you know, always keeping notes of, you know, what's going on. And um, so it, it was just accumulating um, material upon material and, uh, and then trying to figure out how to uh, make it coherent. Did, did you guys ever have like a documentary in process as you were doing like the last couple of years? Did, did you have people videotaping things <laughs> for you and following you guys around? Uh, no. Wow, that no, would have been cool, wouldn't no. it? Yeah. It would be impossible to, uh, an ev- to investigate this case, you know, prior to Marty's release with, uh, with lights, cameras, and action Well, the closest, the closest thing was 48, hours. was 48 Hours did really, really good work on this. Uh, they did, what, four segments? They, they, would, they had a base, the, the first one they did, and then they would they would do it every time there was something new to update. They would run it again with some new stuff and then the, all the earlier stuff. So um, they had uh, they, they were with Jay in Florida when he was uh, looking for a couple of witnesses. So they kind of had that sort of you know the detective on the case um, footage, and um, uh, so that was you know he got a little sense of what it, what it's like to be Jay, you know, with the. The shorts and sandals in Florida. Right, wearing well, my suit and tie. Right. <laughs> what was Marty's family like? Because it looks like they they were very supportive. Um, the, the, what did they do to help support the case? I know that they did. Uh, they wrote letters and they, they did a lot of things in court, and they always said that they were going to fight for his freedom. What were they like? Especially considering that um, the main part of the family, which was the mother and the father, were, were murdered. Right. Well, I have to tell you, you know, when you speak of Marty's family and and knowing them now for close to eight or nine years, and the the you know when you when you watch television shows, police shows on TV, you know, and people come up to me, wow, is it like this? Is it like that? You cannot recreate life. You cannot cre- recreate emotion of what you know I went through, the attorneys went through, and the family. I look at a lot of members of Marty's family now as my family. I mean, there's a bond between us. We cried together. We we celebrated together on on his release. We we knew failure. We knew victory. He's got a wonderful family. That's I mean, the support that they gave Marty. I mean, you have to understand it. It still costs money to to have a family member in prison. I mean, stamps alone. I'm telling you how many letters he wrote. You know, where do you think those stamps came from? Phone calls, you know, reverse charges to call family members over all those years. You know, the expense factor. But most of all, to Marty, he, it was the emotional, the emotions of his family backing him. That's what, you know, helped Marty, you know, gain his freedom. In, in terms of the, okay, let, let's talk a little bit about the Innocence Project, because in the last hour we really couldn't. What what is the Innocent Project? What, what is the Innocence Project? Who is it there for? And how could people help the Innocence Project as members of either the legal community, the regular community, journalists, or the like? The Innocence Project is there for the people that Marty left behind in prison. You know, as a, as a former detective, uh, I've come to terms now working in the private sector as a private investigator that you know what mistakes happen. We're seeing it more and more. I mean, look at Barry Sheck, in the, who I work with, uh, you know, in his Innocence Project, where approximately, if you take 100 people that have been released from Barry's group, 25% that have been freed on DNA that said they didn't do the crime, 25% of those confessed to the crime. 
So that tells you something's going on, in the, unfortunately, in the squad rooms, either by mistakes or the heart or, you know what, there, there are people in jail that shouldn't be in there. And that's what the Innocence Project is for. You know, it's my letters. It, 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 you know, they come to, you know, like Marty wrote to me. Now they're coming to me through Marty and my own, our own innocence group, the Fortress Innocence Group. And we get tons of them. Not only us. I mean, Barry Sheck gets them. There are other, you know, throughout the states, the 50 states, there are innocence groups. And it happens. And we look at these letters. We go go through them carefully. If I feel that there might be something there, we send them an application. It's a 22-page questionnaire, and they're going to have to pass that test before I'm going to go myself and Marty to put ourselves on the line and try to sell that to a major law firm with their pro bono groups to pay our fees, you know, which are discounted investigative fees, you know, to hopefully help these people get out. And I'll tell you something. It's the hardest thing in the world to do once a person is convicted to get them out, and especially without DNA, and that's how Marty came out. And you have to understand now, DNA and Barry's group, I mean, it's going to dwindle down. You know, now the, the, the detectives and police departments, the FBI, they, they take DNA. So the people now that are there prior to DNA, it's, it's almost exhausted. So it's really the, the new innocence groups and projects are going to be investigative projects trying to get people out on cases that were unfortunately, you know, poorly investigated. Let's talk about, do you want to say to, something? To, on the, on yeah. the DNA, I think, you know, <clears throat> one byproduct of is that uh, it's raised the bar on cases so that now everybody, you got to have DNA to 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 uh, get somebody out of prison who's innocent. And, it, and, you know, here's a case where there was no DNA to, to use. And see how hard it was, seven years. Now, part of it was the, you know, what was going on in Suffolk County, but uh, it, 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 the, for all the cases where there's not DNA, now they've got to face, well, where's the DNA? I'm not going to believe anything unless there's some DNA proof. I noticed in the book that you talk a lot about lie detector tests. And that's really something that us lawyers don't really come into contact with. And it's, I guess, for the general public, all they see is on TV. I know that um, polygraphs were used in your investigation. I'd like you to talk about both in terms of the investigation and in terms of the Innocence Project, do you actually, after they fill out their 22-page questionnaire, do they actually go through another hurdle of passing a lie detector test in order to really keep you guys in the loop? I love the polygraph. We, as we all know, it's not, you know, it's not admissible in court, but as an investigator, and it's been said many times, it's a great investigator's tool. And, and, and the misconception with polygraphs, it's basically who gives a polygraph. And I think one of the reasons why it's not admissible in court is because there's very few controls over it. I, I, should, I should point out that actually there, there, it's, it's usually not, but there are cases where it has been admissible. So there is a little bit of a in appeals a trend. In, in, in motions. I think. Not more well, in is, is it the kind of thing where if you fail, that becomes admissible? But if it, if you pass, you well, uh, that depends on yeah. who knows who's if the person's getting the polygraph. But but to go back to your question, I every you know when when my gang came into this case and I knew that we found Glenn Harris, that we're going to have you know I did due diligence on my witnesses. Marty Tankliff was polygraphed on September 11th. Before, you know, I really put my heart into it, Marty, you're going to get a polygraph. Passed 9-11. Glenn Harris, the driver of the car, passed. Colleen Kovacs, who gave us some crucial information, took a polygraph, passed. That gave us and myself the abilities to know that, you know, I have confidence in this case. And I knew the Suffolk District Attorney's Office is going to try to beat the hell out of me and these witnesses. And, and to Marty's defense team... They put me through hell before I would before I could have a witness. I had to do a strong due diligence on everything that they said really had to be corroborated. And to their credit, not one of our witnesses, I don't believe, was ever found to be a liar. Well, I remember reading in the book that you gave a statistic about the number of people who are willing to give polygraphs was indicative that, that they probably were telling the truth. It was like a high percentage of something. I, I don't remember the statistics. They're, they're actually, uh, it's actually in, in um, a pol one of the police, um, the main sort of uh, the Bible of, of interrogations, uh, cites a figure that, that, that uh, you know, indicating that uh, suspects who volunteer to take a polygraph 
tend to be innocent. And do you know who you know, requested to take a polygraph? Who? Marty Tankliff. The day that he was in the room with James McCready, he asked to take a polygraph. McCready denied his request. And on 48 hours, while being interviewed by Aaron Moriarty about that, well, about the polygraph, he says, well, I'm better than a polygraph. Really? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great tool. I mean, Jay, is, 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 when he was a detective, you know, you've you've talked about this. How it's right, a, I, it's just a it's a it's a tool. You know, if you want to, if you're if you are a, a, a competent, honorable detective, you want to know the truth. So why not do that? I mean, I don't know. You know, you're telling me the sky is blue. I mean, I could believe you. I could say you're lying. I don't know. I, I, so the polygraph basically will give me the opportunity to know if you're lying or telling the truth. Now, if you're coming in here for a robbery, and I think you did the robbery, and then you tell me, no, 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 and then I put you on the polygraph, oh, I'll take the polygraph, and you fail, it gives me the confidence to go further with you, all right, to keep going that I've, I think I'm on the right track. And many times if a person fails the polygraph and you tell them, They'll concede. Can, can you beat a polygraph if you're a good enough liar pathologically? And how much does the polygraph depend on who's giving it? Because will there be interoperator variability? I, I think, you know, the answer to your question would have to be answered by, like, who I use, Joel Reichert, or who gives a polygraph. But, uh, you know, as to, yes, I think it depends on who's giving the polygraph. You know, you know that, that that's why the controls of you could take a course, the Apex course, and come out and you're a polygraph operator. Joel Reichert, who does a lot of our polygraphs, also does polygraphs and teaches for the United States Defense Department. I mean, the guy is impeccable. He will not play. He's straight as an arrow. You pass, you pass. You failed. You are you're lying. And Joel Reichter, uh, to his credit, is one of the best. And I feel confident if I would get a young detective or a young person just out of school, I don't know their experience. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, it, it really does depend on, on the expertise and, and the experience of the operator. I, I noticed when in the book that it seems that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that when you, the polygraphs were administered, they only asked like three or four questions. Was it really that short of a, an exam, or was that just more of the snippet? Well, that's how polygraphs are given. You, you know, you see sometimes in television or some comedies or whatever, they're asking them 30 questions. Yeah. You have, like, control questions. You have control questions like your date of birth. So, you know, he could. these are pre-tested questions, so he could, he's going to read if you're lying or not because, you, you know, he knows your date of birth. And do you know that before you, ta when you, before you take the polygraph test, you're going to know the questions? These are not surprise questions, and you really ha you know, you can't ask m numerous questions. Do you have knowledge of the crime? Did you commit the crime? Cases, you know, questions like that, just to keep them in. And, and the, uh, the polygraph operator, and I'll mention name Joel Reichert, will go over the questions with the subject. It's not a surprise. What, i got to ask this question of more of a curiosity, but after the person takes the polygraph, does he actually find out the results? No. Not, Interesting. Not, well, I'll tell you why. Because Joel Reichert and many other polygraph operators have to read the tests. There's, uh -huh. there's like three of they, they, they just don't do it one time. They do it one, a couple of tests. And does he know? Yes, he knows. But legally, he has to read the test. You will find out maybe within a couple of hours or the next day. But Joel and many other operators will not just tell you how you did immediately. No, they'll tell you, but they'll will they tell, tell the person? Will they tell the subject? No, no. First of all, that's not their job to tell the subject. It's my, it's their job to tell me and how I want to handle or when I want to tell the person, which will benefit my investigation. That's when you're going to find out you passed or failed. Wow. You are listening to Taking Care of Business on TCBRadio.com, 89.7 FM, WCWP, and my guests. And my co-host is Paul Solomon, and my guests are the authors of A Criminal Injustice. Uh, it's the story of Marty Tankloff's um, uh, rescue uh, from, from pretty much uh, a life sentence. Um, I noticed that you guys talk a lot about 48 Hours, Dr. Phil, and some other media events that happened before the 
you know, the book was published. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and, and some of the significance of those events, especially maybe like the Dr. Phil um, show where uh, there was some surprise information that may have come up or everybody kind of looked at their notes afterwards and they were like, is that what, you know, like that kind of stuff? I'll start with it and I'll let Rick finish it. The media, one of the reasons why Marty is out today is because Marty had a terrific public, public relations group behind him. Uh, Lonnie Surrey, Rick Friedman, he put this case out there. The case multiple times was on 48 Hours. It was on Dr. Phil. And every time we aired, new witnesses or new people came forward to me or on the tip line. And I th I'll let Rick finish the rest of the question on, on the I'd benefit like of this. For, please give the tip line phone number again for our audience. 718-570-4183. Uh, Completely confidential? Everything is, will be confidential. All right, cool. Have you got any uh, tips recently uh, since the book was published? No. Okay. No. Right. That, but then, but it, I'll, I'll tell you why, though. I mean, because Marty is out since the book is published. But, you know, if you know this week, the Marty's uh, Barry Sheck, who is now Marty's attorney, we filed, he filed a civil case. So once again, the case is out there, and Marty is aggressively going to pursue, uh, you know, the murder of his parents. And I'm still the investigator in the case. And uh, the line has never been closed and will be open until Peter Kent, Joe Creedon, Jerry Stuman, and Glenn Harris are arrested. Oh. Rick, you are going to say something? Yeah, I, I, a, a, an example of uh, how uh, the coverage actually led to a witness coming forward uh, Court TV had a, uh, a another private investigator named Jerry Palace did a uh, he had a documentary series called um, I think it was called An Innocent Man Question Mark, and so he did he did um, uh, a film on on the Marty Tankle case, and we were talking earlier about how uh, Jerry Stewartman, the Bagel King, who was uh, behind the murders because of the debt he owed to Marty's father. Uh, how he was friends, had a relationship with the lead detective, James McCready, that was hidden because McCready uh, testified at the original trial that he never he never met Stewartman, didn't know him, had never lighted, never even heard of him. Um, when when this uh, court TV segment aired, I think it was in around two, 2002, um, he, he thought there was something strange about McCready and Stewartman, did, did they know each other? And in, in one of these kind of uh, voiceovers, he, they show him uh, going to see McCready and interviewing him, and as he leaves, they have a voiceover. He says, he says I wondered if there was more of a connection between Stewartman and, and McCready. So uh, a guy named Leonard Lebrano in Suffolk County was watching that, and he knew there was a connection between Jerry Stewartman and James McCready, and he wound up coming forward to talk about it after seeing that. So that was a case where where some of the publicity really triggered some some serious information. And a classic moment because Lenny Lebrano owns a pizzeria, and when he came to court to testify at our 440 hearing, he was literally in his pizza uniform, <laughs> wow. right, testifying on the stand. Uh, in terms of uh, Seymour, because this is he, he seems like a very interesting persona did did he ever do anything to protect himself or did he did he feel that he had risk out there i mean that you talk about the poker game and money and loans i mean there's this is whole part of that yeah that, it's that a, it's an interesting it is an interesting question because and it's ambiguous because we, we it seems that there was some fear that there was discussion in the family marty and his parents that there there was talk of um, you know, so, uh, Stuerman threatening because there was so much, there was a lot of fighting going on and pressure and back and forth. Um, and uh, so people ask, then, then, then why would he let Stuerman into the house? Now, this was a poker game. There were eight guys. So I would imagine that he felt safe, you know, those eight guys. Stuerman was the last to leave. And I, yeah, really, Seymour let his guard down because uh, what seems to have happened is that Stuerman. Uh, actually, was out in his car in the driveway, and let the other, the last other person go uh, out, out the driveway. And Stewartman seems to have gone back into the house, and then let you know signaled to uh, 
Creedon and Kent to come in. So, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he probably could have protected himself better. Did, when, in your investigation, did you do like a whole crime scene layout and, and try to, for the court system, reanimate what actually happened under your theory of the case? No. No? No. I, I looked at, you know, the, the trial and, and some of the evidence at the trial, and that was the beginning of my investigation. I mean, if you look at the trial, there was no evidence that, you know, Marty was convicted, true, but there was no evidence, that we, you know, forensic evidence or, except for this confession. So my, my focus here was to find people that knew what happened in that house, uh, people that might have known the murderers, and I hit, a, I, I hit a home run with Glenn Harris, and it opened up the door for me to finally actually know to a degree what happened in that house. In, in the very last... Um, when you were in the Brooklyn Appeals part of the case, did you have hope that that was going to be the turning point, given all the setbacks and disappointments before? Or you just kind of, you know, sometimes they tell you as a strategy, don't be too hopeful because then you won't be crushed. Well, it, it was a lot of fear there because this was going to be our last shot. I mean, we, we lost in Suffolk County with all this evidence. We, we, we lost. So the appellate court was going to be our last day. But I'll, I'll tell you, it, it was an amazing day. We had Steve Brogger, who was a phenomenal attorney that did the uh, one of the arguments on the new evidence, and he just blew Leonard Leto away because Steve Brogger spoke the truth. The Suffolk District Attorney's Office, Leto looked totally ridiculous. He was like a laughing stock uh, with his argument before the appellate court. I got, was there any attempts for either a pardon? either on the state level or on the federal level or to commute the sentence or I mean did they try that track too not that I know of not that I know of no and, and <clears throat> you know a pardon would would be you know kind of an admission of guilt so uh you know there was I don't think any reason you know to go down that road i mean there was uh you know this is this was the 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 best shot and um you know as long as there was any justice in the world i think there was reason for marty and his family and the attorneys to be optimistic about the appellate division because you know it was once it was taken out of Suffolk County, uh, you take that whole factor out of it, and these are real, you know, these are serious judges, and and th that hope you know was was confirmed. I actually remember being in front of the appellate division because um, I had an appeal there once, and I was about I, I was about to get up, and and one of the judges said, "You know, you don't really need to say anything." <laughs> Because <laughs> we actually had a really good shot at what we were doing. And I just said, I, I need to just say something for 15 seconds just to justify my appearance. <laughs> but they were, they were very sharp. They had read all the papers. That's I couldn't well, believe it. It's a really different experience I, when you go to the appellate division. I it's have like, to tell you, right? They, well, there, there were, you know, they, they say don't, the lawyers always say, don't, don't um, assume anything from the judge's questions, you know, that it means they're leaning one way or the other. But I think in this case, you could... You know, there were things that were, seemed so clear that they were – how they were going to rule or how they were feeling. You know, one of the judges uh, – well, well, Lato, the, the assistant DA, uh, talked about uh, the witnesses being uh, not credible because they were, they were um, in, into drugs and they had been in prison. Some of these – some of the people in this crowd who would know what happened are not good guys. Um, and one of the judges – challenged him and said, well, Mr. Leto, you use people like that all the time as a prosecutor. Isn't that right? And, and uh, so, you know, sort of knocking that argument down. And you talk about the judges reading everything. I mean, this is this. They had a lot to read. I mean, I mean tangled you know, with papers fa over how many I mean, years. So you know, it. thousands of the transcripts. And, and, and that, uh, that same judge, uh, you know, new, new, de new details. And we we're talking about the knife. And he said it would turn out to be it was watermelon on that knife, didn't it? You know, so things like that sort of indicated that where they were, they were, you know, that, that they were educated. In terms of financing all the expenses, were there fundraisers? How, how you know? I mean, a family can only afford so much, and I guess this, you can only volunteer so much. There must have been crushing expenses in terms of just travel and forensics and you know time. The, the expenses were picked up by Baker Botts. I mean, all the lawyers on Marty's case, including myself, work pro bono. I mean, an amazing amount of money. When I had to travel 
you know, to go. I had to travel to Florida a couple of times. I had a, you know, other trips to interview witnesses. It was always paid by Steve Breiger and, and Baker Botts to that credit. So the family, I mean, you know, thank God Marty found, you know, a group of attorneys, and that's what the Fortress Group does too, to find attorneys that will will basically pay for your investigation. Do you know what, a, uh, as an attorney, could you imagine his legal bills, what they would have been? Well, considering that he was in jail for 17 years, that's 17 years of billing with vendors, right. process servers, investigations. Copies, the copies. Uh, copies, and really, filing I fees, typing. You know, and you just uh, hit on something about 17 years. I mean, this wasn't a case of, okay, he's convicted, he goes to prison, and then 17 years later he has an appeal. This was this never ended. This is t- really 20 years from, you know, 1988, 2008. 20 years of endless, there was always something happened. There was always an appeal in the works, even the, when the last appeals, uh, you know, the last hope was even the Supreme Court in uh, 1999 or 2000. And then immediately, you know, when that's over, that's when the letters to, to investigators starts and one of them going to Jay and Jay starting. And then, of course, seven years of solid you know, investigation leading to these appeals. Did you live and breathe this case? Did you work on anything else? <laughs> Well, I lived and breathed this case, and it, it, I, honestly, it affected, you know, some of my other business, you know, because my life was this case. I mean, I had a, many other cases, but my interest was in, in Marty. I mean, once you become part of this, you become addicted to this case. And, you know, it I know just from reading the book. I was. Yeah. yeah. My, my family life was affected, and to their credit, the support that they gave me. Like I said, you don't know what you're dealing with until you work one of these cases or with a group of characters and witnesses that we had, you know, but the witnesses, I never, you know, never felt threatened with some of these witnesses or even the murderers. I was more frightened. And the people that always put me in the hospital were the district attorney's office. If you can give me a number, how many physical bodies worked on the case in terms of lawyers, paralegals, secretaries, investigation, investigation support, I don't know, photographers, messengers. I mean, you know, do you have like, was there, was there more than 125 people? I would yeah. say uh, Marty's attorneys, I mean, with all the, the firms and the support staff of the attorneys that he had would have to be, you know, and I'm well, just the, guessing. Yeah, I think the attorneys um, probably numbered a couple of dozen as far as, you know, just having any, even a small piece. But the the final appeals, which, which really had only the major attorneys, I think there were 11 named, wow. and these were all at big, big firms. Um, that's the thing about it. People, you know, lawyers, <clears throat> obviously Jay, but, 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 but you know, lawyers would, would get into this, and they couldn't let go. And even when they, you know, they would move to a different firm, they'd still be part of it, you know, years later, because there was something about this that was such – such an injustice, and it was so clear. And and I think Marty again, you know, was able to sort of keep people in it. That never nobody. It's the case nobody ever left. And I got I had as a writer, I felt it in my, you know, writer's way and you know, journalist um, that it became, you know, just so consuming because of the you know the, as a story that was just you couldn't believe every corner you turned there was something else that was incredible. Is there any part of the story up to now that you still feel is missing as far as a piece or information, or do you think you have it all pretty much understood up to where it is today? I think we have it pretty much understood. I think we're we're right on the money with who's involved. But we, we, we need, unfortunately, to get a little more over the hill. You know, the, 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 the such as such as. Well, I think we're going to need a little more evidence on Jerry Stuman. Uh, it would have been nice, and it could have been done. Uh, Peter Kent, who is one of the people you know that we've named and we named out of evidence as the murderers, when our hearing started, Peter Kent, if I would give you a little description, is about six foot four, all muscle, you know, a really scary type of guy that if you saw, you would run across the street. He was arrested. He was in River, you know, uh, in jail, out in Suffolk County, and during the hearing. Leonard Lato and the DA's investigator, Walter Walkerthine, went to interview him. Now, what do you think this monster of a man did when they walked in? He started crying. He started crying. Why would he cry? 
as a good investigator, you say, oh, I got him. He was crying because they, he thought they were coming now to arrest him on, on the Tankliff case. What did they tell him? And he testified to this. I'm not making this up. The district attorney and the detective told Peter Kent, Peter, don't worry about it. We know you didn't do it. They had him. They had him that day that Marty Tankliff might have been out of jail maybe five years earlier wow. if they did the right thing. Wow. So in turn, I don't want to talk about the current civil case in terms of beyond what it is, but just for the people listening, there's a current case that was just recently filed. It's a civil action. What is it about and what does it allege? And does it go beyond just Marty's case in general? Well, the civil case was filed this week, and basically w w what they want to know is why this happened. Why? That's what it comes down to, why. Suffolk County knew uh, many years before the Tankliff case that the detectives, I mean, the, the New York State Investigation Commission found them to be liar. The, the Suffolk County, the Suffolk County Bar Association re requested that all... Uh, you know, uh, interrogations be videotaped. The appellate court, 10 years uh, from 78 to, to like 87, 10 convictions were overturned from Suffolk County. Something was wrong in Suffolk. Why did they were on warning? I mean, they were told. How come they didn't do anything? And who became a victim? Marty Tankliff. So the main focus of this is why? We want to find out why nothing happened in Suffolk to, to change their, their systems with the police and the prosecution of these cases. Uh, with the, fa the case was filed where what court? Federal court? or Federal court. Federal court. Federal court. Uh, Eastern District? Suffolk mm -hmm. County, yes. Okay. And do you know what the complaint asked for as far as damages or relief? No, I, I honestly at this point I don't know, but, you know, it, it's been said, how do you put a dollar amount? on what Marty Tankliff went through. But at this point, I don't know the dollar amount. Is he seeking the, the wrongful incarceration period as, as damages? Uh, you know, yeah. I, yeah. But I, basically, I would prefer one of Marty's attorneys okay. when they came I was just curious, like, cause you, whatever you may... I, I didn't really get a good sense of what I read in the newspapers, what, is it, what, what it was exactly about. The point of the, the case... The new case. Yeah. yeah. The, the point of the civil case is that uh, the, the county uh, is, is negligent for allowing that, that essentially this was a an injustice w waiting to happen. It's actually Barry Sheck's quote the other day when it was filed, because you had you had McCready uh, who had been known to, to have perjured himself in a prior murder case, who had a terrible reputation. Um, you had the entire homicide squad known to, to have confessions that were suspect uh, and, and other uh, procedures that they had. That, that, that's why there were so many cases being thrown out. So that they were unnoticed. They, 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 they knew that there were terrible things going on. And this could have been avoided, should have been avoided. There's no way that, that Marty should have been in this position on that day. So I think that the essence legally is that's, that's where they're coming from. Because of the case, have other people like Marty, have they come forward asking to be given the same view? Or That's why we're getting those letters. Right. And, right. I, and I'll tell you, many letters are coming from Suffolk County, many uh, inmates from Suffolk County. Prisoners there are, there are th three cases that we know of, at least, that um, of uh, murder convictions in Suffolk County from the 1980s that uh, are, are there's good reason to believe these are innocent men. Uh, are you working on any of those? Yes. Wow. Yes. And two of them, two of them, we uh, we talk about in the book. Cool. That, speaking of the book, you, you kind of feel that after you put this book down, that you really need to reach for a volume too. <laughs> is, is there? A, you know, I'm not putting any pressure, <laughs> and you're not under oath or anything like that. But will there be sort of a, a follow up in some form, either in terms of an audio book or you know, an e-book or something to talk about, so we're, like the where are they now kind of thing. I don't think there'll be another book, but when, when it's uh, usually a book comes out in paperback a year after hardcover, and so depending on what happens, if there are any further developments, you know, we might add to the last chapter for that. 
Wow. And then, of course, the movie. <laughs> I, 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 since you brought, are, are, do, do you hope to put this into? Uh... I would love, you know, if it if it becomes a movie, you know, but that's you know beyond our control. But we're waiting. And I, I could see Al Pacino having your part, just you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's talk about you guys as individuals because it's amazing. This we we've gone through fifty minutes of a second hour on on this topic, and it's just it's just blazing. What, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit, Rick. About some of your writing, what you've written, and 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 what you're working on now, as far as projects and things like that. Well, I've written a number of books. Uh, I write I write nonfiction books of all kinds, and uh, I like to tell stories. So I write, you know, s- sort of uh, narrative journalism. Uh, one book, uh, actually, the first book that I did, I collaborated with my wife, Jamie Talon, who's a science writer, and it was a book about a woman in upstate New York uh, who uh, smothered her five babies in succession over a six-year period, and it was ascribed to sudden infant death syndrome. And a, uh, a, a researcher built the whole fraudulent theory of SIDS based on this case, and it was another sort of cold case situation where 20 years later a DA, in this case the DA was the good guy, and went back and, you know, investigated it and brought her to justice and also, you know, sort of exposed the fraud of that. So that was... Uh, Prior to that, I, you know, and I thought I would never have s- such a rich story as that, and and until this, it's uh, that's why I don't do true crime books as a rule. I mean, I've only done, in, I put that in quotes, true crime. Um, this is only the second one over, you know, between fourteen years, because uh, I'm not interested in writing about the murder of the week, just some, you know, uh, some uh, uh, garden variety story, but. The Marty story, like the other uh, the other book, was really really different. So that's what I do, and I, I always look for uh, I just look for stories that have layers and are not you know that just have some ambiguity about them, and um, you know just sort of uh, pieces of it that could be fit together and make it a uh, a story that people will won't put down. Can we take can we take a peek on what you're working on next? Um, I, I can't say yet. Okay, but, something in the works, but we'll see. But maybe we'll get you to talk about it on the air in the future. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> so, Jay, tell us about your firm. Well, I have my own private practice, which is Jay Salpine Associates Private Investigation. And thank God, you know, uh, I said I didn't get paid from the Tankliff case, but it, it, you know, the notoriety has been very good for for my uh, career and for my business. Thank God I, I deal with a lot of high-profile attorneys, in which I get some high-profile cases. But I still love to do the innocent cases. I was just retained to work on the West, Mem- uh, the West Memphis Three case. Yeah, tell me about that. Well, that was a horrible, horrible crime in 1993 in uh, West Memphis, uh, Tennessee. Three young boys were found murdered and, you know, mutilated in the water. And eventually, three young men, including my client, Damien Eccles, were arrested, once again, based on a false confession. It's an amazing case. Uh, it's almost a lot of similarities to Tankliff, where there's a struggle against the district attorney's office. And, uh, you know, these fellas, what I see so far, the case was not properly investigated, and I'm going to give it to them, too. I mean, I'll be going down... Uh, April 13th, and I plan on spending a long period of time off and on down there until I could get these guys home, and I'm confident I will. Right. Um, there's great fruit in Memphis. We did a show on that. I was there last year, and uh, the, there's some great ribs, and <laughs> there's dry rub and wet rub. We'll talk about that some other time. We're off the air. Did you have a question? Yes. Just only because we are a college environment, I'd like to ask, for, on behalf of any writing students who are interested in doing the type of journalism that you do, what advice would you give them? Well, you need to be a reporter. I mean, that's that's what I am at heart. And I started out as a, uh, I worked at a smaller paper in New Jersey, and then I worked at Newsday uh, for 16 years as a writer and editor. Um, and I, you know, I think to to do books, you have to sort of take it to another level of of storytelling, and it's got to, you, you know, you have to uh, you have to do a lot of, lot of deep reporting, and you have to have the ability to to uh, write it in a in a way that uh, unfolds a story. Um, but but basically, uh, you know, journalism is journalism, and so I, anybody who wants to write should write and do it as much as possible. 
I, it's, it's, it's amazing how fast these things. I wanted to ask Jay, you, you were a detective for many years. Yes, a New York police detective. Okay, there's a great little story in the book that I'd love you to share about some stolen items from Canarsie, Brooklyn. <laughs> well, when I, you know, I'm a Jewish detective, Jewish cop, and I got to Canarsie, and, and the first case that I that I got was a, a Torah that was actually stolen from Yeshiva, Yeshiva Terrace in, in Canarsie. And to make a long story short, it's my first case. I went out there, I, I, I met the rabbi, Rabbi Young Rice, I spoke to him, and once again, a miracle. I, I figured, <laughs> let me go speak to the porter, because there was no break here. So I, I called the, the porter up, I told him I'm coming over to his house, I want to talk to him. I, go, I get there, and I'm walking up the steps, I knock on the door, he's not there. I said, well, I, I told him I'm coming, you know. So as I'm walking down the steps, the Torah was in, in the garbage can. Wow. This is the first Torah in the history, believe it or not, of the world that was ever recovered and brought back to its proper owner. Because at that time, you, there were, you couldn't mark a Torah to, to, for identification purposes. So, you know, that, you know, I brought it back to its owner. And Rabbi Young Rice was going to have a function, you know, for the Torah. And there would be a... Uh, you know, a special guest of honor. So maybe my ego or whatever, I thought it was going to be me, right? And, you know, I got there and I'm having a couple of drinks before, you know, the uh, the actual event. There was a cocktail hour. And I guess I might have had too many cocktails. So, but at that point, he tells me, well, the, the guest of honor is a Torah and we want you to carry it in. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, those things, that, that, they're heavy. They're heavy. Yes, and they I are. don't know how Especially I, when you've had a few cocktails. Right. I don't know how I made it to, uh, how I made it to the uh, stage, but we both got there in one piece. Wow. So as we're wrapping it up, wow. Um, give us the information and telephone numbers for... The Fortress, in, Fortress Innocent Group and J. Salpine Associates Private Investigation, could be, we could be reached at 516-759-1511 with regards to the Marty Tankliff case, which is still going on now, civil, and, you know, we want to get the right people arrested here. The tip line, 718-570-4183, and all calls will be held strictly confidential. Okay, and Rick, um, your website for, for the book is? Acriminalinjustice.com. Okay, and what's on the site? I know there's a blog, and what else is there? Well, we've got um, articles that have been uh, written about the book. There's uh, there are links to uh, uh, some interviews, including this one, and um, uh, information on the case, on us, uh, the blogs you said. Yep. Well, all I can tell you is this: if 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 you're ever going to throw you those sixty thousand words that um, that didn't make the book. <laughs> I'll read them before they go to the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the book is that compelling. No, oh, thank you. So, so anyway, as we wrap this up, the book is called The Criminal Injustice. It's published by Random House. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all those and great book places. Bookstores everywhere, as Bookstores everywhere. It'll probably come out in paperback in a year from now. Something like that, yeah. All right. Uh, this is a, a co- very compelling story. It is, uh, as a lawyer, I could tell you that the book was both well-written, intriguing, uh, the whole the whole criminal justice system was just uh, fascinating to watch and to learn from. Uh, you kind of, as lawyers, you know, we tend to only see the same things over and over again, and it's useful for us to see um, other traditions to to reflect back on what we need to know in our other cases. I'm a civil lawyer, and I do commercial cases. So anyway. Uh, Jay Salpeter, thank you for coming. Thank you, for And uh, Rick, Fris- Rick Frischman, not Frischman. <laughs> Got to say a little Rick Frischman out there who's recovering from hip surgery. Uh, we miss you, Rick. And Paul Solomon, uh, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. So, again, if you want to uh, give us a call here at the station to talk about this, you can call us at WCWP. We are at tcbradio.com on the Internet, tcbradio.mypodcast.com. For podcasting, and you go to iTunes and put the word in TCB Radio, and you'll catch us there. And uh, if you want to send us an email, uh, that's TCB Radio, WCWP at Yahoo.com. And again, uh, the phone number for J. Sal Peter? 516 759 1511. All right, and uh, to check out the book, go to a criminal And uh, if I were you people, I'd be running to Barnes and Noble right now. And going, getting a cup of coffee and uh, getting that book and starting to read it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in a week. Appreciate you listening. Thanks so much. Bye.